Hi, uh, good afternoon, good morning, good evening uh, to everybody who's on the Shegblu webinar. Uh, nice to see so many people come along to another one of our webinars. First of all, just want to say uh, I hope everybody is well uh, and not getting their brain fried too much by uh, being stuck in the houses with our, our families. Uh, hopefully there's some light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, before we go on, I just wanted to say as well, uh, myself and, and Andrea, who are uh, presenting this webinar today, we're obviously working at home. Uh, we're at home like I'm sure everybody else is uh, on, on this on this uh, webinar. So we're sort of saying it, it's, it's lockdown rules. Normally, if we do a webinar, we lock ourselves away in an office and uh, certainly don't get disturbed and certainly don't have any technical problems. But we, we, we're at home, so uh, we can't guarantee that there won't be a, a few uh, appearances by ch teenage children or even younger children or, or wives or, or what have you. Uh, so presenting today is myself, Giles, I'm the, the CEO of Shape Blue. Andrea uh, has been co-presenting this series of webinars with me, but on this one, uh, I'm, I'm going to I'm going to take the lead on it. So Andrea is, is hoping, I think, not to have to say too much unless we get some very, uh, tr very tricky technical questions. Andrea, do you, do you just want to say hello to everybody? Yeah, we know perfect. you're online. Hi, everybody. I can hear you well, Joss. Thank you. Great, and I can hear you well. Fantastic. Okay, so this webinar, uh, it's come about because, actually, it's come about because of lockdown. We, we've had a, a shape blue here. We've had an unprecedented, unprecedented demand in people engaging with us as a company and also through the open source Apache community wanting to find out about Cloudstack for the first time. and you know, without doing too much analysis, I think a lot of it's being driven by a lot of organizations realizing that they haven't got a proper self-service infrastructure offering in place, particularly in the service provider space. Uh, maybe historically those organizations have, you know, done a halfway house. So they put some a virtualized layer in and if they're a managed service provider, they've uh, sort of managed that for, on behalf of the customers. But we're seeing now that people really want to find out about uh, self-service infrastructure. So we decided to turn it into a webinar instead of having lots of conversations individually. Uh, just a word of warning, if you are experienced with CloudStack, you've already got it deployed, already running it in your organization, I'll say this from the beginning, this webinar probably isn't for you. This is, this, this, this is, this is a uh, looking at CloudStack from the beginning in terms of what we can use it to do to, to deploy self-service infrastructure. In terms of agenda, we're going to talk just quickly about ShapeBlue, our company, just some standard marketing stuff. We'll get through that quite quickly. We're going to talk about Apache CloudStack, have a look at its use cases, have a look at some of the, the highlights of its functionality. I'll do a demo of CloudStack through its UI uh, and talk again, just sort of show you some of those, those headline features. We're then going to go through uh, two or three recipes to do a POC, which is normally the first step after finding out about CloudStack that organizations want to do. They, they, they want to get it on the bench. So we'll just give you some tips around that. Quick chat around uh, considerations for, for designing a production environment. Uh, we'll tell you about the CloudStack open source community. And then we're hoping to allow 15 odd minutes for, for, uh, for Q&A at the end. Now we've got a lot of people, uh, nearly 100 people uh, on this webinar today. So we can't open up the mics for everybody. It would, turn into a you know like a family zoom call chaos uh so if you can use the go to meeting uh question button that that's what it looks like there if you're on a, a, a windows or a, a mac desktop i think it looks a bit different if you are on a tablet as you think of questions ping them in there we've got a list both andrew and i've got a list in front of us and then when we get to the end we're going to work through that list of, of questions that, that people ask so the idea of this webinar isn't uh, to talk about Shape Blue and what we do commercially, but we, we, as we've got your attention, we're just going to take two minutes just just to do that, so you know who you're listening to. Shape Blue, uh, we're, we're cloud builders. We build uh, public and private cloud environments. Uh, most of our customers are service providers of some some degree or or another. Although, say most, probably about 75% of our customers 
25% are traditional enterprise customers. And we provide a, an expertise layer in terms of engineering services, architecture services, support services, all focused around Apache Cloud Stack. So Apache Cloud Stack is at, is at the heart of everything we do. We've been around for about 10 years, uh, nine, 10 years. Uh, we've got five offices around the globe. We've got customers in 22 countries, I believe. Uh, and just to give you an idea of those sort of customers, standard sort of logo slides. We work with some very, very large organizations. Uh, just mention one there, KDDI, for example, one of the largest service providers in Japan, uh, GTT Interroot over here in Europe, but also work with a lot of small organizations as well. As well. So there you'll, you'll see some uh, service providers listed in here that are uh, very small organizations. And there's lots more of them. And some of these are, we would call enterprise clients uh, and some quite big name enterprise clients as well. Key thing with all of those organizations, by definition, if they're working with us, they're all running Apache Cloud Stack. So let's have a, uh, a chat about what Cloud Stack is, if you're not familiar with it. Uh, this is the official line from the, from the project's uh, website. Cloud Stack is a scalable, multi-tenant, open source, purpose-built cloud orchestration platform. Uh, I'll explain what cloud orchestration and infrastructure as a service is in a second, but just the points I've highlighted there, it's just worth understanding before we move on. Cloud Stack is hugely scalable. Uh, going back to my, my customer slide earlier, we've got organizations with many thousands of hosts under the control of, of Cloud Stack. We've got organizations with two hosts under the control of Cloud Stack. So it's very, very scalable. It's designed to be multi-tenant from the ground up. The initial design of Cloud Stack was for service providers to provide public cloud infrastructure to their customers. So it's intimately multi-tenant all the way through. And probably most importantly, it's open source. It's Apache Cloud Stack. That means it's it's free to take software. Uh, it's free to con you can contribute to it. You can amend. You can change it. You can put in feature requests with no ongoing licensing fees. Okay, so infrastructure as a service is what CloudStack does. Uh, let's just you know, have a look at how we go about building an IaaS environment. And I first saw this slide about 10, 11 years ago when I first came across uh, Am this small company called Amazon who had just built this, this thing called the Elastic Com Compute Cloud, EC2. And Amazon were presenting I was at a technical briefing by them, how, how they'd gone about actually building that. And they showed a slide similar to this. So ultimately, there was some infrastructure underneath networking, storage and compute. They layered up a hypervisor over the top of that. At the time, Amazon used a, a, their own fork of, of, uh, of Zen. They then wrote an orchestration layer or a cloud management platform, I think as, as they called it at the time, which allowed them to automate all of the functionality in the hypervisor, in the networking, in the computes and storage. That exposed an API and then they bolted on top of that an e-commerce platform. I mean, Amazon had one at the time because they were selling books and CDs and, and that sort of thing. And that's what eventually became EC2, uh, foundation of, of, of AWS. And what CloudStack gives us or, or gives service providers is the ability to create those type of services. So we take uh, some networking, some storage and some compute. Uh, we, we can sort of lift it from anywhere in, in our data center. It doesn't necessarily have to be dedicated infrastructure uh, just, just for this piece. And then we assume that uh, organizations are going to bolt a, a hypervisor over the top. One of the the key points with cloud stack is it supports a range of hypervisors uh kvm vmware zen hyper v ovm even xcpng which is the new open source distribution of zen and things like bare metal as well uh, and in fact we can run different hypervisors in one cloud stack environment i'm going to talk about more more about that later we put apache cloud stack uh on top of that hypervisor or those hypervisors CloudStack exposes uh, an API. It also exposes directly a, a user interface. I'm going to show you in a second. Uh, it has a, a thing we call Kubernetes service, which lets you exploit Kubernetes to orchestrate containers inside a CloudStack. And it has a command line tool called, called CloudMonkey. 
Uh, last bit to pop up there, e-commerce platform. It's the bit that CloudStack doesn't do. CloudStack doesn't give people the uh, the commercialization side. Cloud CloudStack is a is an infrastructure orchestration platform. It's not necessarily a commercialization platform. It's relatively easy to bolt those bits on. There's lots of products. There's lots of easy ways of uh, of doing it. Uh, we're not going to focus on on that side of things today. We're just going to focus on on core cloud stack functionality. Now, when people are then using those services, they then might bolt on top of of cloud stack other things. You know, depending on the use case, they might put a PaaS layer on top. Uh, they might put developer tooling because they're using cloud stack underneath a CI/CD pipeline, for example, some sort of multi-cloud management tool. Um, and what we're seeing increasingly with cloud stack is it's becoming the uh, the foundational layer underneath other bits of technology in the stack. Kubernetes is a great, great example. So great, the standard way of, of building Kubernetes clusters is just to deploy them straight into uh, physical infrastructure. But what you can actually do is use CloudStack to give you elastic physical infrastructure underneath as your clusters need to scale, etc. Now, I know I've already shown a, uh, a slide of our customers, but I just wanted to give you an idea of uh, the, the type of people who, who use Apache Cloud Stack. You'll see there's some overlap with, with our customers here, but there's also a lot of other organizations. And it's an open source project. It's not marketed particularly well. It's, uh, they, they, there's no marketing department at Apache Cloud Stack. And it often comes as a surprise to people that uh, organizations like such as some of these are, are actually running CloudStack. And there are hundreds of them out there. Uh, these are just the ones we know about from the open source project. And what's also quite interesting is uh, there are a lot of organizations we know are running CloudStack, but don't publicly talk about it because they don't publicly talk about their tech. Uh, great anecdote on that was uh, at our conference last year during the, the keynote, our, uh, our, our VP of, of the open source project at the time uh, brought up a guest speaker and that guest speaker was from Apple. Right? And, and, and they publicly declared that they are running a massive cloud stack environment underpinning a lot of their uh, online services. Most people in the cloud stack community didn't know that uh, and didn't have that awareness before they they just they just turned up and and uh, started talking about it. Okay, there's a lot of choices uh, for infrastructure as a service. Uh, I just wanted to highlight why we think well we at Shake Blue have got drawn to cloud stack over over the years. And we we started as a company. We were pretty agnostic around the technology. We work with a number of different orchestration tools. But just got drawn more and more to Apache Cloud Stack. Number of reasons for that. Uh, first of all, Cloud Stack is a is an is an end-to-end -end IaaS product. Okay, it doesn't do the commercialization piece I talked about, but most service providers have already got ways of doing that. But it's a bit of software. We stick it in our environment, point it at a hypervisor to network storage and compute, and it will start to orchestrate. Other, you know. Things like OpenStack is a great example, which is a very well-known uh, uh, set of projects. OpenStack is a very big, very complicated set of projects to, to get working together harmoniously. Uh, so what CloudStack gives us is this, is this sort of rapid time to value, right? So we can very, very quickly stand up environments. It's proven at scale, lots of people using it. Uh, because of its relative simplicity, uh, and I think its legacy of it having come from being a, a initially it was a, a commercial product that's then become open source. Uh, it gives us very low implementation and operational costs. It's multi-tenant out of the box. Uh, the community that develops it uh, is governed by the Apache Software Foundation. Uh, so what we know from that is that uh, we're not going to find that the project suddenly gets taken over by a vendor and taken in a crazy direction. And that community is mainly user led. So it's mainly people who are running CloudStack who contribute to that community. Got a relatively narrow scope. It's not trying to solve all of the world's problems. And finally, it's free. It's open source. You can download the packages and, and spin it up tomorrow. In terms of the use cases, uh, Really, we, we, we classify people who run cloud stack, you know, operators of cloud stack clouds into two things. They're either running private cloud or, or public cloud. 
hybrid, a combination of, of both of those. On the public side, that tends to be service providers. That tends to be people who are offering public cloud facilities to their customers. Uh, on the private side, there's a huge range of use cases, uh, automation use cases, R&D and test environment use cases, DR use cases. Uh, private cloud we see as basically everybody else uh, apart from the, the service providers. In terms of key features, uh, out of the box, we get a lovely web UI, we get a command line tool, and we get a REST API. Uh, remember, if you think back to my diagram, CloudStack is abstracting all of the complexity of the network storage and compute and the hypervisor and just exposing that via an API UI and a, a command line tool. Broad hypervisor support. Um, and it's an interesting use case we get for CloudStack is a lot of organizations who are reconsidering their, their virtualization platform will bring CloudStack in almost as a stepping stone because CloudStack is multi-hypervisor. Uh, and to be frank, often these organizations are moving from VMware for cost purposes to other hypervisors like KVM. But by putting the CloudStack layer in, it lets them do that without causing too much uh, business interruption. We support Kubernetes clusters. We've got enterprise grade uh, virtual networking model, which is really one of, uh, it's almost the crown jewels of CloudStack. So as a user of CloudStack, as well as just provisioning uh, network and storage, uh, sorry, uh, compute and storage, I can also control my networks as, as, as through, through its self-service interface. It's very scalable, the biggest environments uh, we've known about of CloudSat was 35,000 physical hypervisor hosts being controlled by effectively a single CloudStack instance. It also gives out of the box high availability, things for failover, etc. Uh, depends on what hypervisor we're using, exactly how that works. In terms of UI, uh, it's a role based user interface uh, which is used for both the admin side and the user side of CloudStack. And depending on who I log on, on as, I'm going to get different uh, functionality in there. Uh, it's used, as I say, predominantly as the, the self-service interface. And I'm going to show you some organizations later who just directly expose this, this user interface out to, on, the, on, on the public internet to their customers. And normally, people will do some degree of rebranding of, of that interface, even if it's just a, a brief color change to, to make it uh, Fit into their their corporate uh, their, their their corporate scheme. Now, just to confuse things for those of you new to, to CloudStack, uh, we actually we had our 414 release of CloudStack only last week. In fact, we did a webinar this time last week on 414, and 414 ships with a, a technical preview of a new user interface, which is a replacement. Uh, it's that one down there on the left. Excuse me. Uh, so we've actually got two user interfaces in play at the moment. I've always spun a coin in terms of demoing today, which one I'm going to use. I'm, I'm going to go with the, the new one because it's it's slightly shinier. Uh, I might just flip quickly into the old one just to just just to show you the, the concepts are all the same. CloudStack also has a thing called the CloudStack Kubernetes service, uh, and this lets us deploy Kubernetes clusters onto our infrastructure uh, as the basis for then using Kubernetes to orchestrate the containers. The logic here is that most service providers, as well as having a, a, a VM, a virtualized based offering, also want a container as a service offering. And this lets them do both in one place for, for, for their customers, for, for their end users. Also, things like uh, metering and billing and consumption of that is all recorded by CloudStack in, in one place. So it's a very quick and easy way for service providers to be able to, to deliver Kubernetes, well, container as a service or, or Kubernetes as a service. Okay, I'm going to do a quick demo of CloudStack if the demo gods are with me. I'm, as I say, I'm at home, I'm VPN, VPN'd into our lab, so hopefully we should be okay if I can find my mouse. And I'm going to use the, the new uh, user interface, uh, which is codenamed Project Primate. Okay, so as I said before, you would expect to normally see this branded. You, you won't find many 
uh, many service providers with the, the cloud stack logo there, you'll find their own logo and entry points from their own uh, business process systems and that sort of thing. I can log in directly with CloudStack, always support single sign-on through SAML. Uh, that's mainly around private cloud use cases. So for example, we have a massive university in Latin America uh, that use federated uh, CloudStack instances. So they use a single sign-on across all of their, 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 their different departments. I'm actually just gonna sign in initially as a user. Uh, and this is the dashboard. Uh, all of this is sort of customizable. Uh, this just gives me an overview of what resources I've got, a number of running VMs, stock VMs. It gives me an idea of, uh, I've got a form of event log so I can see what's been going on. Uh, if I just click around, I've then got, I can navigate down to all of my instances, my Kubernetes clusters, we've got a thing called instance groups, what storage I'm, con I'm consuming. Uh, then I've got things like snapshots, which are like a backup, I've actually got explicit backups I can do it in CloudStack. I've got my networking control where I can configure the guest networks, which are my tenant networks that nobody else can see. Uh, lots of other bits. I'm not going to go through absolutely everything today. So let's have a look to start with with compute. I can go in and look at my instances, and these are all of the uh, the virtual machines I have as a tenant, as a user of this, this cloud stack environment. And I can drill down, what have we got here? Test VM, I can drill down and have a look. That's a, uh, I think that's a core, uh, not core OS, a center, yeah, a, set, a CentOS 64 bit machine. I can look at that and see, you know, what networks it's connected, what its disk sizes are, its IP address, et cetera, et cetera. And I've also got uh, lifecycle control functionality here. So uh, things like, for example, I can I can click and view the console of that machine directly. CloudStack's got its own mechanism for giving me as an end user direct console access into into that uh, into that instance. Uh, I can reboot the machine, start, stop it. I can I can create snapshots. I can create backups of that machine. I can attach ISOs to it, reset its password. All of the standard control. Those of you who've used EC2, you're, you're, you're used to this sort of stuff. So I, I, I can control the, the, the life cycle of, of that virtual machine. If I want to create a new one, uh, I just go to instances. Oops, excuse me. Just choose add instance. Okay. And I can do this with providing two bits of, of information. I'm, I'm going to take you through some, some more of the details. Uh, so, okay. first of all, choose the zone that I want to uh, deploy this machine into. Similar to uh, Amazon availability zones, these tend to map in the public cloud world to specific data centers. I've got three here, London, Frankfurt, and Berlin. They're not actually in London, Frankfurt and Berlin, they're all in our lab, uh, but I'm going to deploy into, into London. Uh, I can actually just go and deploy now and it's just taken all of the defaults which have been configured by the administrator, it's going to create a Ubuntu being the default operating system, it's going to base it on a small instance, click a button and that would be done in a few minutes. Uh, I'm just going to show you some more of the options uh, as a user. I can, uh, for example, specify the keyboard language. That's important when the machine boots for console access and that sort of thing. Uh, I can choose the template uh, that this is going to be built on. So I've got Ubuntu there, CentOS. Uh, these are Core OS, Core OS, where we've even got Windows uh, templates in there. Again, the whole point is here, these are things that would be configured by the, by the operator, by the service provider, uh, to allow users to, to choose different types of, uh, of operating system. I'm gonna keep it easy and just go with Ubuntu. I can specify offspring, and this is how big do I want the virtual machine to be? Uh, again, this is all configured. We, we've just create, created four in our lab here. Uh, how many cores, how much memory, et cetera, et cetera. I'm gonna just go with a, a small instance. Uh, disk offering, I can create a, a, a data disk to go to go with it. I won't bother at the moment. Affinity groups let me uh, push, sort of push together 
virtual machines or keep them away from each other. Classic example is uh, I've got a master slave database configuration and I want them to definitely not go into the same physical host. Uh, I choose the network that I want to, to deploy this onto and I can, I've got three networks. Uh, these are, these are all uh, virtual networks created by PowerPoint. I've got three available to me here that I've previously created. I can add it to multiple networks. I'll just add it to Giles test, or I could even go and create a new network at that stage and specify the IP address, et cetera, I want and create myself a new virtual network. So I'm just gonna go with my pre-created network there. Okay, bang, launch virtual machine. And what CloudStack is now doing is going off and orchestrating via the hypervisor, I think it's KVM in this case, could be VMware, we've got both in this environment. It's gonna go off, orchestrate is going to create that uh, networking environment using a, a virtual appliance, attach that uh, VM to, 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 that, uh, to, to that network, bring the VM up, apply any configuration that needs to be uh, applied, and then it's, it's ready for me to use. That is an instant, that, that can take a few minutes depending on the size of the machine, the hypervisor we're using, et cetera. So that's just a, a very quick feel of the very common uh, things we, we can do with Cloud Stack. Um, something else I just wanted to show you, as I say, is probably the, the most powerful bit uh, of Cloud Stack is, is its networking uh, model. And what I can do is uh, I can, in here, I can go and look at what guest networks I have. Uh, and I can go and create as a tenant of this environment, as a user of this environment, as many networks as I want. I'm gonna to go to that Giles net I, I was talking about before. Okay, so here I've got uh, the basic information about the network, where its gateway is, etc. I can set egress rules from this network to, to the outside world. And I then have also got the IP addresses. Now, these are the public IP addresses uh, that would be used to present this network to out to, to the internet. This is in our lab, uh, so that isn't a true public routable address here, but normally you would see a publicly routable address there. And I can then drill into that address and actually configure firewall settings, configure load balancing, port forwarding, etc. CloudStack orchestrates all of that through a set of virtual networking appliances, which are, as I said earlier, completely multi-tenanted. So I, I've got a I've got a Windows server running a running a uh, internet information service on on this network. So what I'm going to do is just allow public access into that web server from the outside world. So first of all, I'd need to just uh, allow something through my firewall. I'll go all in here and allow everything through my firewall on port 80. Good, okay. Oh, just notice there it's finished creating my virtual machine it's actually just giving me a prompt back to tell me what the the root password is for that that machine that i, I created earlier okay so i've created uh my firewall rule uh i probably need to do some port forwarding to so that public ip on 80 hits that machine i've created uh so again i'm just going to do this for port 80 oops and public port 80 as well and I then need to choose which of my virtual machines I'm going to forward to. Uh, there's my Windows server. I know it's got a basic web server on it. And that's it. It's done. So I should now, I've now got, I've allowed access in through my firewall, too much access to be, to be frank, but uh, I've port forwarded onto a specific VM on this, on this network. So I should now be able to from the public internet there we go there's my uh, public web server so i've got full control over the compute side of things and the network side of things and i mean again i've only really just touched on it there but uh, also from you know from a networking viewpoint we support uh, endpoint vpn site to site vpn which allows people to, to mix in their own infrastructure with stuff in, in cloud stack clouds we support load balancing etc cetera, etc cetera. and that's all orchestrated uh by by cloud stack 
A uh, couple of other things just to have a quick look at. I mentioned earlier that we support Kubernetes clusters. Uh, it's very easy. I can go here, just choose Kubernetes, just get rid of that message. And what this will do, this is Cloud Stack orchestrating the network storage compute, but it's also doing some clever pieces in terms of deploying Kubernetes into a set number of, of machines, turning them into a Kubernetes cluster, creating the, the, the master nodes for Kubernetes, the worker nodes for Kubernetes, making sure the binaries and everything are all up, up, up to date, and then creating access through CloudStack for me into that cluster. So very simple. Uh, leave that blank, choose the zone, choose the version of, of Kubernetes I want to deploy. Depending on what version, I then get different features I can choose, uh, depending on what that version of Kubernetes supports. Choose my cluster size. So in this case, I'm, I'm going to say I'm two worker nodes. Uh, Kubernetes version 115 only supports one master, one master node. So by definition, I'm going to get two worker nodes and a master node here. Bang, off we go. It does want a description. And this actually, this will take a few minutes because it's got a whole load of, of, of stuff to do. The idea there is that that's a foundational place for my Kubernetes clusters. But as a service provider, as somebody running this environment, you're now offering containers as, as a service as, as, as well as a virtualized offering. So I hope that just gives you a, a, a quick flavor of the sort of stuff we can do uh, as, as a user. I'm not today going to log on as an administrator and go through all of the, the behind the scenes stuff that's just to, to give you a flavor of what uh of what cloud stack looks like okay uh everything that's in the ui uh comes from the cloud stack api in fact th there's more functionality in the api than there is in, in the ui some stuff doesn't make sense to to put in the in the, in, in the ui uh in most cloud environments, whether they're public or private, more work is normally done through the API than, than on the UI. And that's that's around the use cases in cloud stack. People want to use this to automate things, to do things at scale, to do things on a batch basis. So they don't want to be clicking through a UI to do it. It's a simple REST API. Uh, there's just some, some examples there. Uh, everything I've done or I've shown you in the UI there, you can you can do on the API. We have a, there's an authentication, uh, public private key uh, mechan mechanism for authentication. Uh, it is possible, what I've done here, just to switch that off temporarily, just to, 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 to be able to demo it. We also have a CLI, we call it Cloud Monkey, uh, and the, the CLI sits on top of the API, and it lets you then do, again, everything that's in the uh, API, lets you do that from, from the command, command line. The type of use cases, the type of reason that, that the people are using these as opposed to a to a, a user in to the, to the user interface. Uh, as an operator, as a service provider, people often want to do their own custom portal on top of CloudStack or or integrate IaaS stuff from CloudStack into their existing customer-facing portal. You can do all of that through the through the the API. Uh, you want to do integrate into your existing billing your existing bss systems again you can do it all through the, the cloud stack uh, api what most service providers then do is then make that api available to their users as well and the users then can then use the api for doing all sorts of things so you know sort of use cases uh creating scalable infrastructure underneath other platforms for scripting r d and test environments so of uh, private cloud use cases where what they're doing is standing up big complicated uh, environments with complicated networking pieces in between them deploying code into then running tests and then pulling all of that down again afterwards and then repeating and repeating and it's quite easy to, to write scripts in the, the language of your choice to call the, the, the cloud set api to do things like that uh, automated deployment of uh, production environments we've got a, a customer of ours who are a very large sap reseller and uh, consultancy and when they build complex sap environments for their customers 
they start by basically provisioning that with a set of scripts against their, their, their cloud stack environment. Uh, disaster recovery environments, another good use case. And then also sitting underneath CI, CD pipelines, which is pretty much the same as uh, R&D and test, test environments. In terms of cloud stacks architecture, how it sort of hangs together. I'm, again, I'm not going to go into massive detail here. Uh, so we, we've, we've only got an hour. The sort of headlines, first of all, from a from compute perspective, it doesn't matter about the hardware. Uh, we need usually, unless we're doing a bare metal thing, which CloudStack does support, but we, we need some sort of hypervisor and we can pretty much support any any hypervisor. We have support for you know, Zenzo, VMware, OVM, KVM, Hyper-V. Uh, a word of warning, it is an open source project and the depth of integration on different hypervisors does vary. Uh, KVM, Zen Server, VMware, CPNG have very, very deep integration. OVM and Hyper-V, not, not quite as much. We then have, well, CloudStack has two, two types of storage it defines. Primary storage, which is where the, uh, the, where, where the actual hypervisor data goes. A uh, whole range of stuff we support there, iSCSI fiber channel, local disk is often a, 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 a preferred model in, in very large scale clouds. We then have direct integration with things like Ceph, uh, NetApp Solid, Fire, much deeper in integration. And we then have a concept of secondary storage, which is where we put our static assets, like the templates, backups, uh, uh, snapshots I was talking about before. And this is normally a lo lower grade storage. Normally we use NS NFS there, but we also support Swift. You can even back it out to, to S3 storage if, if required. From a scalability viewpoint, I mentioned that CloudStack, you know, has some some very large environments uh, run, run through, uh, from CloudStack, and it has a number of constructs that support a very large environment. You can use as many or as few of these constructs as you want, but in in summary, we we, we start with a host, which is a, a hypervisor host. The user never sees that; that sits behind CloudStack. Uh, we then have the concept of a cluster, which is a set of hosts of the same hypervisor, uh, normally normally sat in, in, the, in the same place. Uh, we can have multiple clusters, each one can be a, a different uh, hypervisor. We then have the concept of a pod, which normally equates to a, a rack in a data center uh, with its own layer two uh, networking. And pod is interesting because pod is normally the scale point that people choose. So as their environment grows, they normally drop new pods in to add more capacity. We then have zones. Uh, zones are normally analogous to a data center. Uh, my example here is, is Amsterdam. We may have a London zone. And we even have a concept of regions, which lets us federate whole instances of CloudStack into often used in different geographic regions, as in, you know, we may have a, an Asia region, we may have a, a, a Europe. The actual uh, architecture of CloudStack is quite simple. Uh, and I looked at this slide just before I started, and the CloudStack is simple and then show a very complicated diagram. The key point here is all of the components that are required to do all of this orchestration all run on a platform we call the management server. We don't have dozens of distributed components. Uh, we can distribute some of this, but in its simplest form, a CloudStack management server is attached to the network and it can starts to control network storage compute through a, through a hypervisor. So all of the things we were talking about earlier uh, is all done inside the, the, the CloudStack management server. In terms of the deployment model, uh, there's a, a, a pretty standard looking uh, data center there. So we've got hosts these would be in we the, the terminology we would give them is uh is clusters each with its own primary storage which is what the the hypervisor is uh is is, is going to be based on that's normally shared storage that gives obviously uh, advantages in terms of things like ha uh but it could be done with local disks in those hosts uh, we have some secondary storage we then bolt in the cloud management server which sits on top of a mysql database 
and that's pretty much it. Okay. The important thing to understand here is what CloudStack is doing is acting as a as a control plane. So when a user comes in through whatever firewall you've got in place to access services on a host, they're doing that as they would if as if CloudStack wasn't there. CloudStack does all the clever stuff in setting all this up and orchestrating it. Once it's up and running, you don't need CloudStack. In fact, you could switch off the management server and all of the infrastructure will still run. Uh, it's only required when people need to make changes to that infrastructure. So on this diagram, the only bits which are CloudStack are, are those two in red. And we also have a, a concept of virtual routers, which is how the virtual networking is done. And they are CloudStack pieces. But they get deployed, and once they're deployed, they're left pretty much left alone by CloudStack that run as virtual appliances to, to do all of the, the routing functions. So that just gives you a flavor of the architecture of, of CloudStack. Most people, you know, they, they, they see CloudStack and they say, look, this is, this, this is something we, we may be interested in. They normally want to run up a, a, a quick POC. Now, it's quite easy to go and find people who are who are using CloudStack and look at it from a user perspective, which is what I've seen you, uh, I've, I've shown you today. What people normally want to do is actually get that onto some infrastructure in their data center, in, in their lab, so they can see how it works and how it integrates with different things, different hypervisors, that, that sort of thing. So I'm just going to give you some headline guide, guidelines now in terms of the best way to go about doing a very, very simple POC. So I've created my first recipe book, uh, I've got three recipes here, so a very basic POC. Uh, what we actually need uh, is a hypervisor host. We need some NFS storage, CloudStack management server, and a supporting SQL server, and a switch that can do VLANs. Now, we've got other isolation methods in CloudStack, but VLANs is by far the most, uh, the, the most common. Uh, and typically, two hosts, put CentOS on, on the first one, and then from there, we would then run uh, the, the database, the management server, and also set that up as a, as a storage server as well. On host two, put a hypervisor of your choice. Uh, KVM is by far the simplest to, to start with, and have a, a VLAN, a switch that supports VLANs on, underneath. This is doable on one physical host, uh, but, it would only be doable with KVM because KVM is sort of Linux as well. I recommend using two so you can see how the two hosts interact and that sort of thing. In terms of building that POC, go and read a uh, summary of the CloudStack documentation. Uh, specifically have a look at the networking. It's important you understand that from, from the beginning or have, a, have an appreciation of it. And I haven't even touched on, on the, the complexity of the networking models here today. You're obviously going to ask questions about what CloudStack supports. And, and, and the, the starting point for that is, well, normally whatever the hypervisor supports. Uh, so, you know, does it support this sort of storage? The answer is, look at your hypervisor. If it supports that storage, CloudStack will support it. Now, CloudStack doesn't support every feature of every hypervisor we have to work to a, a common feature set because we're hypervisor agnostic independent uh, but most of the the common things that people want to do with a hypervisor uh, cloudstack will support uh, final tip don't try and do this in aws or somebody else's cloud if you're very very clever you can make it work but the whole point is here you want some physical hardware or some virtualized hardware so you can actually see how this thing works if you if you do it in aws you're into nested hyper hypervisors and it all gets very very messy very quickly uh, so in terms of what you do download cloudstack a couple of places you can you can you can do that from Build your MySQL server, install CloudStack, start the CloudStack management server. There's a bit of config to do. You can follow the, the install guide for that. And then pretty much everything else is done in the GUI. We have a thing called the zone creation wizard, which will kick in first time it's run, which will ask you where your storage is. It will ask you where your hosts are. You add the hosts, et cetera. So it's almost like a, it's a, it's a first use wizard, if you like. Next recipe would be building on that. So you, you've, you've got CloudStack up and running. You think it looks good. You want to start to think about more in the direction of how you might put this into production. Uh, I'm not going to exactly how you do this, but 
First of all, I would split your primary and secondary storage so you get an idea of the sort of requirements and performance requirements for, for those different types of storage. Add another hypervisor host. Uh, that's as much as anything for you to see how to add hypervisor hosts, which you're going to have to do as you move into to production. You're going to have to see how this, this scales. Start to think about a design focusing around pods and clusters. And you could, if you were intending on using multiple hypervisors in your environment, you could actually introduce a second hypervisor at this stage just to see how they, they, they sit side by side. Uh, finally, you'll probably be up to about four physical hosts here. We would normally in production split the, the build what we call a management farm, which is splitting uh, MySQL down, uh, having, having master slave configuration of, of MySQL and a redundant pair of cloud stack management servers. That, that's the default production configuration. Uh, and then from a networking perspective, cloud stack has four different networking types, which is all around the multi tenant uh, iso isolation and also around quality of service. So making sure that huge big data transfers of things like templates and snapshots don't affect direct access in, into, into VMs. And at this stage, by default, all of those will, 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 will be, will be, won't be isolated. They'll all be together. At this stage, you want to start to think about spitting those out so you can, you can, you can see how that behaves. Okay. In terms of more information, where to go, uh, as I've mentioned earlier, there, that's where you can download CloudStack. There's the CloudStack documentation, the CloudStack website, cloudstack.apache.org, uh, and there, there are mailing lists. It's, it, this is an Apache project, so ev everybody interacts around mailing lists, and literally anybody can turn up on any of the mailing lists. We need to register for it. Say, hi, I've just downloaded CloudStack. I'm trying to do a POC because some guy called Giles recommended it and I'm having problems with this or I have questions about that and our really friendly open source community will help you out uh, and will we'll give you a few ideas and uh, normally with a warm welcome. Obviously if anybody wants any commercial assistance that's what we do here at Shape Blue. We'd be happy to take a, a call from you. Uh, the other thing in terms of exploring functionality is uh, don't be scared to go and look at some existing deployments. I'm, I'm just going to talk through here, uh, pick two or three. So, Least Web, they're good friends of ours. Uh, they work in the, the open source community. They're a, they're a uh, uh, service provider from, from the Netherlands, significant size service provider with a footprint all over Europe and in the US as well. Uh, and they run services on top of Cloudstack. You can go along to their website, uh, I think sign up for some of those services. I don't know if they've got a free tier, but uh, you can get a very cheap pay-as-you-use uh, tier, and you effectively will be using Cloudstack. So it gives you a very quick and easy way of going back to that user experience uh, without having to build your own POC. Uh, Interroot, GTT Interroot, again, another company. There, theirs is a... a Pretty significant size uh, IaaS environment, all built on CloudStack, 17 different countries, 17 different zones. They've got a hybrid model they use. And actually, you look there, that's that's their UI, but that's their own UI where they brought other things in. But it's basically a customized version of, of the CloudStack UI. Exoscale, who are based in Geneva, uh, they're, they're quite interesting because they they position themselves as the developer friendly IaaS environment. So it's everything there is geared around uh, tooling for, for developers. That, that's their basically their, their route to market. And what's interesting here is this, this is underpinned with CloudStack, but actually they've taken a completely different user interface, their own, and put it over the top. So again, it gives you an idea of the sort of things you could do with CloudStack if you didn't want it just to look like CloudStack. In terms of designing a production environment, uh, I'm going to say this, th this is the point people normally phone Shape Blue and say, hey, come and, come and help us with this. Lots of people don't, lots of people just go and go and do it themselves. And the headlines here, if this is a private cloud use case, look at your workloads, look at the type of workload you, you've got, because that's then going to drive everything else. You obviously need to do some capacity planning, you know, in terms of both storage, uh, the amount of CPU uh, memory you're going to need. We can over provisioning CloudStack and we can play a percentages game 
with, with cloud stack, especially in a public cloud environment, but you have to think that, that through a little bit. You need to choose the version of, of, of cloud stack you want to use, what networking model. I haven't even gone into detail about cloud stack's different networking models today. Uh, thinking about management farm and also what hypervisor uh, you or hypervisors you, you, you want to run. This is often a, a pre-made decision because an organization has a tie-in with a particular hypervisor or skills around that hypervisor. But often putting CloudStack in, it's seen as a time to reevaluate what virtualization layer an organization is using, etc. Okay, uh, other things to think about, network design, how we're going to isolate the, the different types of traffic, what our scale point is going to be. So this is normally what done by pod, but one of the things we look at when we're designing these environments is it's very easy to say, you know, a service provider comes along to us and says, right, we want to build an IaaS environment. And you say, how, how big? And they say, well, we're, initially we're going to have uh, one host, but I, th I think we're, we're, we're going to go up to 20,000 hosts within a year, which what they, they more often than not never, never do. But it's quite important to get the design right to allow an organization to build a, an initial very small environment but then make it easy to scale, that it's not complex to scale. Okay, so thinking about how it's going to scale, how easy that's going to be uh, to do going forwards is, is, is a thing to think about from the beginning. And then other things to bear in mind, you know, what templates you're going to need, sort of type of service offering, uh, what you're going to do with your usage data, how you're going to charge people for it. They're, they're, they're the sort of things we think about uh, uh, when we're moving it into production. Okay, just very quickly, uh, just a bit of information on the Apache Cloud Stack uh, community. Uh, as I mentioned, it's, it's open source. It's developed by uh, the Apache Cloud Stack community. I'm a member of that community, so is Andrea. Uh, it's governed by the ASF, the Apache Software Foundation. Community does three, four releases a year. We also have a, an LTS schedule, long-term support schedule for, for people who don't always be on the latest release. And that the user community is, is sorry, the developer community is mainly user-driven. We don't have a dominant vendor or vendors in CloudStack. It's mainly people who are developing in CloudStack because their company is using CloudStack. Give you an idea of scale, we've got about 200 committers in the project. Uh, in a month, roughly 400 mailing list messages, uh, 1,600 package downloads. They're just just some headline metrics to give you your feel that you know there's quite a lot going on with CloudStack. We have meetups and events happening in lots of different places, which are all very organic and and uh, and informal. And we also have every year we have our own conference, the CloudStack Collaboration Conference, uh, which we're not having this year because it was it was meant to be in New Orleans in uh, October. But it's been cancelled. Right. Everything physical is being cancelled. So we're currently crazily trying to figure out how we're going to do that uh, virtually. In terms of further information, uh, there's some links there. CloudStack documentation, how to join the mailing lists, uh, the CloudStack European user group. That's the one that I help organise. Uh, we have meetups under normal conditions quarterly. Lots of different European uh, cities, uh, a lot in London because that's where where I'm based and, and a lot of my colleagues are based. But we're often in Berlin, Paris. We've been all, all Prague, all over the place. So join that LinkedIn group. That's a good way to, to get updates on that. And then there's a website for for the for the conference. Okay, that is everything I wanted to go through today. I hope everybody's found that useful. We've got. Uh, quite a few questions to get through. Uh, I'm going to try and answer a few of them myself. Andrew, you might want to answer some some of these. Uh, we'll take more questions. So if you've got, if you've got more to come in, looks like we've got about ten so far. If you've got more to come in, uh, we'll we'll work our way through them. We will stop at uh, in seven minutes at, at, at four o'clock UK time. So first question, I'll take this one from. David, uh, how does CloudStack differ from OpenStack and which is best? Uh, well, which is best, I would say CloudStack. But no, it's, OpenStack and CloudStack have been compared for years. Uh, in fact, it's quite good recently. People have stopped comparing them. Five years ago, everybody wanted to see this as a two-horse race. And actually, 
I was arguing even back then that Cloud Stack is a, is a different thing. As I, I said right at the beginning, it's an integrated IaaS product. Biggest use cases around service providers. OpenStack is a collection of 32, 34 projects, all doing different things, uh, which all need to be integrated, which are loosely in the space of, of infrastructure and infrastructure as a service. Uh, if you are an absolutely massive global telco who wants to think about what we do with our entire infrastructure for the next 10 years, that's the, they're the people who are thinking about OpenStack. If you want to just provide some public cloud services to your, uh, to your customers and do some clever networking bits on the side, and you want to do that quickly, you want to do that in a very reliable way, and it not to take nine months to get anything going with it, that's where you would choose CloudStack. So two, uh, two slightly different, or completely different things there. Uh, next one, maybe for you, Andrew, from Mike. Can you see that one? Uh, yeah, uh, from Mike. It says, uh, what version, what versions of different hypervisors does CloudStack support? Uh, so, uh, well, going from the latest 4.14 release, which is the current LTS release. Uh, we support uh, starting, uh, let's say, the lowest versions and, and a bit up. Uh, Zen Server, for example, from version 7.0 uh, uh, up to 8, but not version 8 that will be uh, in, 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 in the newer releases. So 7, 7, 7 5, 7, 6, up to you. But you'd like to choose the same word for the XCPNG, uh, which is actually kind of an open source fork of the same thing. Uh, again, 7.x version. Uh, before 4.14, we, we supported uh, 6.5 as well. Um, anyway, uh, that's for the Zen, uh, for VMware, uh, also in 4.14, uh, CloudStack 4.14, we support now starting from VMware 6.0, uh, or let's say in general 6.x, uh, which means 6.0, 6.5, 6.7. Uh, not yet 7.0. We are hoping maybe for a next winter release, uh, maybe. But that's that's a, again in the community to push forward. And as for the KVM, uh, for example, I'm, I'm just mentioning those three major hypervisors. For the KVM, uh, we support. Uh, let, let me explain in the in the way of the operating system where you install it uh, Ubuntu 16 and up. Uh, so 16.04, 18.04 SLTS releases. I'm not sure quite at the moment we don't yet support 20.04 uh, because of some uh, specifics around some binaries which need different, you know, um, parameters and so on. But yeah, Ubuntu 16.18.04. Uh, same goes for CentOS 7.x. Uh, anything uh, 7.x is acceptable, not yet CentOS 8. Uh, and hopefully that uh, that answers this question. Back Thanks, Andrew. Yeah, thank you. So the next question was from Zara or Sara. Uh, sorry, I'm not quite sure how to pronounce it. Uh, is CloudStack only used by service providers? Is there an enterprise version? Uh, I'll answer that in reverse order. Is there an enterprise version? No, there, there is only one version. Well, one current version of Apache CloudStack. Uh, there isn't a, a different distribution of it. We don't have a vendor with their own version of it. All of the people I showed you earlier all use open source Apache Cloud or a, a release thereof. Uh, we have the different use cases, but the functionality is exactly the same. We, we often design things slightly differently in, in the infrastructure if it's a private cloud use case or a public cloud use case, but there is only one version of CloudStack. Uh, next question was from Joshua. Do many people use CloudStack with VMware? Uh, why would people use CloudStack if they have VMware? I think I touched on this earlier. Uh, yes, in, in short, VMware is one of the major hypervisors that is used with CloudStack. It's not the, the biggest. KV, KVM is the, the most widely used. Uh, why do they use VMware? Well, it's a very good hypervisor. Uh, as organizations, they've got a traditional uh, relationship and skills around VMware. I suppose the question is, why would you then put CloudStack over the top? Well, it gives you that self-service. It gives you that networking model. It also gives you um, an easier mechanism for moving hypervisors, right? So, uh, you know, a stepping stone if, if you want to start to move workloads to, to different hypervisors. Uh, 
Van Kesh asks, how would I set this up if we had infrastructure in different data centers and countries? It's very simple, Van Kesh. You know, we don't care where this infrastructure is. I mean, different data centers, we would normally map them to a zone, but we could have different clusters in, in different data centers, but normally a zone because your users would want to choose to deploy into those different data centers. You only have normally one cloud stack or a pair of cloud stack management servers, which will normally sit in one of your uh, in one of your zones somewhere in the world, and it then just communicates via whatever network you've got in place to to send the automation commands through to the hypervisor. So nothing special about about it being in different data centers. Uh, Andre has asked, CloudStack is open source, how would I go about making a change to it? Uh, the easiest thing to say there, Andre, is go to the CloudStack website, it's still on the screen, I believe, there, uh, join a mailing list and just say, hey, I want to start making changes. It's easy. You can download it from GitHub, you can make changes, uh, you can you can submit a pull request for, for those changes. Uh, it might be useful to go on the mailing list just to say, explain what you're trying to do with those changes and there will be some QA process which kicks in but yeah and anybody can in theory make changes to it. Uh, Marcus asks on the networking when users make a change what is going on behind the scenes does that configure a physical device and you mentioned a virtual router. Uh, so your first question what's going on behind the scenes so when I use the the networking commands in, in CloudStack, CloudStack has deployed what we call a virtual router, which is a virtual appliance that's deployed. Every time I create a network as a tenant, I get a new virtual router. And when I'm using the UI to set port forwarding rules, CloudStack is sending commands through to that virtual router. Now that virtual router is CloudStack's thing. It's not connected to the management server. It runs independently, but they know they're bound together. They know how to talk to each other. Uh, so no, it doesn't con con configure a physical device. The other thing just worth mentioning there, in the roadmap, there's a lot of work going on around uh, actually being able to choose other types of device. So rather than just using the standard virtual router, which does the job, you know, all of these environments that I talked about earlier are, are all based on that virtual router, but there's sometimes used cases that people want to use a particular type of appliance for VPN or for firewall because they're regulated compliance reasons or something like that. So there's a lot of work going on at the moment about allowing people to bring bring their own devices into the uh, into the service chain instead of just using the, the cloud stack one. So watch this space on that. Uh, Elisa asked, uh, what was cloud stack initially created for? Who created it? Very quickly, Elisa, it was a CloudStack initially was a was a, a, a San Francisco based startup called Cloud.com, who then got acquired by Citrix, uh, who then ended up open sourcing CloudStack. Uh, but it started life as a commercial product that was being used even back then by a lot of service providers, etc. And that's what gives us our legacy of being proven and robust and, and that sort of thing. Uh, uh, I'll actually, uh, uh, Andrea, do you want to just answer Egon's question because you spend your time doing this? Uh, sure. So typically, how long does it take time uh, to deploy uh, to deploy CloudStack? So um, I would say the deployment itself uh, yeah, takes, you know, we, we can argue it takes maybe minutes or hours, but you know, realist realistically, with all the planning and everything, uh, we will be talking days to weeks, but that includes planning for a larger environments. But I would say maybe days would be kind of a uh, short answer, I guess. Thank but you. you uh, final question, last question, Ganesh, Ganesh, Ganesh. Uh, is CloudStack limited to specific types of hardware? Uh, no, I think is the short answer for that. Uh, the management server itself has got uh, it needs to sit on a particular operating system, etc. But that, that that's just because it's a, a piece of software. But in terms of the actual infrastructure that it's orchestrating, no. And people we, we have people are using a wide range. Some people go for uh, pizza box styles. Some people go for sort of blade chassis that that sort of thing but pretty much as long as the hypervisor is something we support then the hardware underneath that is it, it really doesn't matter what it is it's, it's about the hypervisor compatibility list 
right, that is all of our questions. We're just a few minutes over. So thank you everybody for, for coming uh, to this webinar. If you need any uh, further information, feel free to get in touch with myself or Andrea. Go to webinar, we'll do a follow-up email in 24 hours, which will give you a copy of the recording. Uh, I think I actually officially get sent from me because uh, I've organized the webinar. Please feel free to get in touch with any queries. Uh, finally, everybody, please take care. Uh, hope to see you on our next webinar. Have a nice day, everybody. Thank you.